C++ 11. The, the standards, the C++, I guess, they release these official standards, right? They're like, here is C++, I think 99, they have them on 99. I know for sure they have them in those train. Right? This is the language that compiler manufacturers will, will create their compilers against that standard. Well, I believe in like the 07, 08 time frame, they're like, we need to add all of these cool modern features that are in C++ 11. They call it C++ 08. And then time went on and it hadn't been ratified yet, so they called it C 09, or I think they called it C OX, because they're like, well, this is taking forever, let's just call it C OX until we actually get it done. So when you see, I mean, you need some special compiler flags to compile the stuff that, I, that I've got here. This is my what can I do? And the compiler flag is STD. C++ 0x, that's where that is. The actual standard was C++ 11, was ratified, I believe, in October, August of last year, August 12th. Um, and to be honest with you, like, we'll, go, we'll be going through some examples, and it'll be pretty good, but most of the content of my talk comes from the Wikipedia article on C++ 11. That's an excellent starting point kind of learn about all the stuff that's in there, and then you can search all, those, all the individual terms that are in that article to learn more about it. Um, let's see, at the end I'll give you a couple of, I'll, I'll give you some links to sites that I found which are really useful. Um, obviously, like, there, there's one on AT&T.com, it's, it's beyond, oops, like, official back on C++11, that looks pretty cool. Um, are there any questions? Without further ado, let's jump in and learn about some of the cool new features in C++11. Um, and in no particular order. So if you if you if you decide to, to clone the repository, what the make file looks like. <clears throat> Basically, I've got like a collection of these CPG or CC files in this directory that you make in the executable name that you expect to be built from that CPG file. And we're going to twiddle the, the flags that we use. Right now there are no flags, it's just going to run G and and then create an executable. Just just so you know. And then I have a clean function that cleans all the stuff that we make. Yeah, it's not going to work. So, okay, so cost expressions. That one might be moving out on the machine I use right now. You did a pull, but you didn't do enough. Ah. 
My code. Okay. So what's going on here? What I want to do is I want to initialize an array of integers. But at least when I first came across C++, I was like, okay, well, I want to initialize an array of integers, but I want to grab it from the internet, or write this length from the internet or something. But you can't do that, right? You have to explicitly tell C++, if you're going to do it this way without new, you have to say, I need one of size 12, or I need one of size something around 12. So let's say, like, anyway, I just want this to work. Can you see kind of what's going on here? There's a function that returns the integer 41, and I want to initialize this integer, or this array of integers to that size. If you run G GCC on this, expect this error. Array bound is not an integer constant. Well, C++11 adds this const expression keyword. You guys see what I just did right there? Yeah. Okay. So enabling C++11 compiling, which all you got to do is say dash std equals C++0x. I didn't test this on my Mac. Shall we go back to my house? <laughs> really sorry about this. Let's see. So make const x. I guess I can add an s missing there. Try using the number 11 instead of OX. It's OX. Oh, here we are. I didn't add the... Um, to your home machine. My home machine. Sorry about that. Okay, cool. Thank you. What's that? We're just debunking your presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, I'm writing it as we go, so... <laughs> <laughs> so that's pretty good. Um, any questions about that? It's supposed to be really useful. I don't know. That's the thing with... So, as an aside, like some of the stuff that we go through here, I have found practically useful. <coughs> I really have found practically useful. Some of the stuff is beyond me as a, as a programmer. I think it's one of those things. I think like some of you are thinking, oh yeah, this is this. I can see how this could be useful. It was the first thing I came across when I was doing the wiki, reading the wiki article. So, here it is. Cool, cool new feature. Um, let's see. <laughs> Oh, there are limitations with this. See the wiki for, limi for limitations. And then you can, um, you can actually have the constructors of your user-defined types be declared this way as well. Yeah, question? So this is a pretty simple example that you showed us. I mean, you're not actually like calculating anything. It's just returning a uh, constant. Precisely. So can you like pass in arguments? And then like, like what are the limitations on, on doing this? Basically, you're asking them to compile them at that time. Yeah. It's, oh no, there are, it's just compile them. Okay. Yeah, it has to be a compile them. Well, I, I mean, so you gave the example of like getting stuff from the network. Could you do that with this const expression? No, I gave that as an example because that's something that I would like to do in Python, but no, it was not. Oh, okay. The limitations are right here. First, the function must have a non void return type. Function body cannot declare variables or define new types in the body. It can only declarations. Okay. So, so basically, it's just a way of not using methods. Yeah. 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 Okay. So that was the first cool new thing. Okay. This one, by contrast, the new initializer list, I have found practically useful for these. In fact, okay. So I guess a little bit more history about me and C++. My brother. Took, C, took CS 142 at BYU last semester. 
Who knew about the C++ language change in BYU? When I went to BYU, it was C++. Okay, then they went to Dobbs. <laughs> <laughs> We're back to C++ and BYU. Um, and so this was this was his first, like he took 142 before his mission, came back and signed up for the next class, and they were doing it in C++. So all of the curriculum was changed to C++ except for 240, which was C++ is now in Java. So they still want you to have exposure to Java. So we can discuss more about that at the end. Um, you start off with Python. Yeah. The obvious answer, right? Um, at any rate. So he took that class, and I helped him in the class, and I thought, well, I've heard about this new C++ thing. I'm going to, be, go, I'm going to go along and, and do some of your homeworks with you and try and learn as much about C++ 11 as I can. Doing that. And so he, he was doing it with traditional C++ constructs, and then he started seeing my code and being like, oh, wait a minute. Can I just do it that way? I'm like, oh, ask your professor. And he was like, oh, yeah, sure. If it compiles, we don't care. <laughs> <laughs> but... <laughs> Anyhow, so this, this is the first thing, these initializer lists are the first thing that I found incredibly useful. Okay. Um, as a side note, yeah. when you're ranting, if you stand a little bit closer to the screen, I'll be able to catch you on okay. the video. So if I stay where I was, I won't be on the video? Yeah, <laughs> your hand's kind of going in. I, I just can't get it wide enough and okay, far no, back enough and high enough. Thanks to know. Okay. <clears throat> So looking at this code, mm -hmm. the other one's still attached to that. Just All right, so I made a struct. Here's one way to initialize variables in C++, right? In a class or in a struct, you do the initializer list up here. Parentheses here, right next to the variable. You can also initialize strings like on line 13 where you say string and then the parentheses right next to it. Another way you could do it is kind of through the, the assignment operator. I think alternatively, you could have also said string s3 equals string, right? Right? Are you seeing how this is kind of excruciatingly complex, right? And, and, and long-winded and what have you. Now they've kind of normalized this idea, and you, and you use braces to do initialization. <coughs> Here's an example of the same thing using the new C++ um, syntax, right? So you say, oh, that's not going to help, is it? Like here on line 14. Good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're totally in. <laughs> um, right, so you say, type, the variable name, and then you say, in the braces you give the, the arguments that go into the constructor, right? Same thing here. Now this is the one that I found super ultra mega cool. So let me, let's go back to the previous file. And I had this question here. Let's say you wanted to initialize a vector of strings. Like a simple vector of strings, what would you do? Well, you say vector string v on the next line, v.pushback a, v.pushback b, v.pushback c. Right? Well, let's complicate that problem slightly. Let's say you want a constant vector of strings. How do you initialize that? As an exercise for the interested reader, go and read the Stack Overflow answer. And this is the answer. You basically have to take the bounds of the of the some sort of um, like traditional C array, right? You're the beginning and the end, but the end you have to calculate in a special way. You have to know the size of the things that are inside of it, blah, 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 blah. Totally feasible, right? This guy has this, this, this um, template thing that he drags around and he uses in all his projects, and blah, 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 blah. Well, I find the alternative syntax much simpler. Right? You can do this is valid C11. You just say, you just say, okay, well, I want a constant vector of strings called S and initialize it this way. <sighs> Welcome to the future, everyone. <laughs> right? Okay, as another aside. So when I started learning about C++, I was also concurrently learning about Go. Um, and a lot of the things that I loved about Go, I was like, oh, wow, they're adding this to C++. Is anyone going to use this? 
right? Because, I mean, you have Go, or you have these other modern languages that give you these features. Why stick around in EC++? It'll be interesting to see history play, play out, because a lot of this stuff is pretty cool. Like this right here, that's way better than the, the Stack Overflow answer. But what if we've already migrated to modern tools? Yeah. Anyway, just, just a thought. Same thing with um, like maps, right? So I have a map of strings to ints. Brace up here, brace down here, and then you do another brace in here, the string, the int. Similarly, right, and I know for sure this will compile, so make new, uh, uh, <laughs> it compiled with a warning I had not used variable, right? I'm fairly certain that you can do this too. Plus eleven feature. Who was who was about to yell at me for doing this? I knew it was okay. Oh, you knew it was okay. Yeah. With C eleven. Yeah. With C eleven. They fixed it, right? And it's funny because I read somewhere. I want to say it was in Strewstrips in the fact they were like, all the compiler manufacturers knew how to warn you about that condition. Why didn't they just do it, right? Like it's. If they, if they all knew how to warn that. Does anybody know what what this what why I'm pointing at? Does anyone not know why? Because the this is the this is the bit shift operator, right? And so the compile the parser would come here and go, I don't know how to make this thing here because this is actually an operator, blah blah. But all the compilers knew how to how to warn you about that situation. They just didn't actually implement. They just didn't do what you wanted it to do. Anyhow, <laughs> the error is quite obscure too. Right? Well, this is C++ after all, right? That's not how much crap got printed to the screen. It's still going to be an executable. <laughs> so, so, once again, on this slide, I guess, on this, on this piece of code, new standardized, oh, and I had it up here too, new standardized initialization syntax, or normalized, I guess. Maybe it's not even accurate. That's the other thing. Nothing I teach you in here is guaranteed to be absolutely accurate or true or valid. But the compiler won't complain to us for the most part, right? It'll, it'll, it'll build executables. Um, I'm no computer scientist. I'm not like a pro programmer or anything. But anyways, I want to. My dad's a lawyer, so I want to make sure I put the asterisks up. Right? Um, so and then and then these the, this cool new extraordinarily terse initialization list syntax. You may note in my notes, they talk about this initializer list thing. I couldn't get it to compile, but it's in the Wikipedia as something useful. Okay. Any questions so far about this? Um, type inference. Oh, baby. Who knows what the auto keyword did previous to C11? I didn't. They have an auto keyword now. It does not do what it used to do. Let me show you what it does do. Okay, okay, okay. So I've made a constant vector of strings called McQuaid's. It's got, it's got the names of all the boys in my family, which is four boys. Stephen, Michael, Brian, Derek. Okay? Then here I've declared a function int, it just returns 42. Then down here, I'm showing you valid C++. The thing I loved, Byron sees where we're going with this, right? The thing I loved about Go is you could say variable name, colon equals anything. And it would, in, it would figure out, I, know, I don't know if it's deduce or induce, but it would, it would figure out what the type was. And you just run with it, right? So i is of type int, j 
J is of type int. S is of type string. Right? This compiles and goes. Now, check this out. I want to traverse the McQuay's vector and print each of them out. I'm violating PEP8 at this point, right? 80 characters. I've already split it down into different lines. But look at this thing. Standard, vector, this type. I've got to get this iterator. I never get this thing right. I generally use it right, right? The quays up again. Watch this. Okay, it ran. Prints out the names. Now watch it. Still run and print out names. Oh, nice. <laughs> you see the power? <laughs> the power is awesome, but there's two kinds of iterators you can get out of the beginning. You can get a constant and constant. Get a non-constant. How does it pick? I don't know. That's a good question. <laughs> it's not like magic. It's probably I would hope it picks the constant. If that's what you want. I think it takes the constant. I don't know. I actually don't really answer that. Right. Wait, you're saying when you call dot begin, it could return either of two types? Depending on what's on the other side. Yeah. Well, wouldn't it just return which one's on the other side? Yeah, but well, on the other side. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, right. That's a valid question. <laughs> but, you know, I show my brother this stuff in his, you know, when I was doing my code, he's like, oh, wait, I don't have to write so much. This is awesome. So once again, I mean, just in, in character count, C++ is becoming more modern, right? With auto. And that's how Go does it. Well, they, yeah, they, you just put like var or something. Yeah. yeah. Figures it out. Did you see? Yeah. Um, but it, it, it is under the hood picking an actual. Uh, it is. It is. Yeah. So type, it's nice. compiled strictly type and everything still. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Very much. That is that is a good point to make. Very C++ sexy. C plus is not magically now weakly typed. It's it's still only mostly strongly typed. As it was, always was. <laughs> it's, just, it's, the, it's the compiler figuring out some the stuff. Compiler's doing yeah. the, the compiler did all that typing for us. So yeah. Yeah. Any questions about that? Oh, and then a, in a similar vein, <laughs> exactly. in a similar vein, you can do stuff like this. Decal type of I, J, or C, Q equals. So the type is actually calculated from whatever I's type is. You can actually pass in any functions and a bunch of different things. I actually have never come using the decal type, but whenever they talk about the auto keyword, they talk about the decal type. Function, keyword, I don't know. So, another exercise for the interested. New string literals. You can actually declare a UTF-8, UTF-16, UTF-32 string this way. I've never gotten into compiler or be useful. So, <laughs> another aside, which we'll get into more later, because I wanted to show you guys some really cool demos on stuff that I find interesting. Um, this doesn't work for GCC 4 earlier than 4.6, I think. So I've got like an Ubuntu LTS 10.04 or whatever that I did all this development on. Nothing was working, and I had to compile GCC 4.6 from code, from source. <laughs> And then some of the stuff started working. And then some of the stuff didn't work, so I compiled GCC 4.7 from source. And then even more stuff started working. And then Clang has a similar kind of support matrix. So the, the trick to this is figure out what you love about the wiki article or this presentation. You go and visit the, each compiler manufacturer's support matrix site. And you go and figure out if it's even implemented. Like regex. I was like, oh, regex built into the language finally, right? You can't get GCC to compile code, any of the code samples for regex. Clang does. But then Clang, the Clang that's on my MacBook, doesn't compile the initializer list stuff. Right? So this is not just an aside. This is like very important. Any of the stuff you get super excited about, be warned that there shall be frustration vis-a-vis -vis compile support. There be dragons here. There be dragons here. So like in 10 years, Red Hat will <laughs> yeah. So to us, six, you're screwed for a long time. Yeah. Tool says. Uh, so in fact, I'd be interested to know Byron on Arch, like whatever the compiler ships with Arch, how much of this stuff compiles or not. It's just GCP four seven. Okay. Okay. So. So we have to wait for the next.
next finger comes out before most of us make the finger. Yeah. <laughs> we'll get to the stuff that I was super excited about and had a hard time getting to run, and we'll talk more about this. But just as a, as a very important aside, there are support issues. It's way better now than when I started looking at it, back in like the August time frame. Um, but yeah, everything I ever compiled ran on, on ran just fine. Okay, so tuple fun. Okay. This one, what this feature is not something that I've had a lot of real world use for, but when I figured it out, when I figured out that it had this, I was like, oh, this is gonna make C so much easier to teach to people. Theoretically. Um, one of the okay, this is interesting. If you go to the to the wiki page, it lists out some of the main goals of the C standard. And this is worth reading verbatim, actually, because you won't believe me unless you see it on Wikipedia. Right? It's, it was joke. Check the history. Unless you're a professor. Um, <laughs> so, what is it? Here we are. Here's a list of why they did this standard. And on this, on this list, right, maintain stability, like here, here is the, the goals, right? On this list, and C++, I know some of you guys are going to just guffaw, make C++ easy to teach and learn without removing any utility needed by expert programmers. So I would argue, actually, that so far, some of the things that I've shown you, eh, they're going in the right direction, right? Um, so, just keep that in mind. How many of you, when you were first learning how to program, and, well, how many of you first learned to program with, like, C or C++ or even Java? Okay. How many of you, the first time you were writing a function, you're like, okay, I want to return these three variables. Right? Isn't that like so natural? You write a function, Python gives it to you, you can return as many variables as you want. Go gives it to you, you can return a whole list of variables. The first thing I ever want to do when I write a function is like, I want to return A and B, or I want to return A, B, and C. Historically, you couldn't do that, right? But they have, they have this notion of tuples, or tuples. I believe tuple is, is, a, is a valid pronunciation. They had pairs, they have pairs in like C++ 03, right? But now these are generalized pairs. You can have them of arbitrary length, right? So I've made, made this tuple, right? Tuple int int. Here's the name C. Say so make tuple by four. If I were to add like a float right here, I can put a float right here. If I had a string after this, I would have five, three point one four, four Stephen. And C would contain all these values. Yeah. Next question: Could you replace the expression tuple tuple angle int int tuple, uh, angle with auto? Excellent question. <laughs> I think I tried that and it didn't work. <laughs> well, first of all, let's make sure this code compiles. <laughs> okay, it does. <laughs> Apparently, you can't. <laughs> That's pretty sexy, right? There. <laughs> That's weird. Okay, so how do you get at these things? Well, there is this function, std get. So some of, the, some of the syntax is still crufty as I'll get out. But you say get, you know, the angle brackets, zero, C, this will print by. Okay? Okay. So they're still cruft. You're, you're still going to feel the warm, fuzzy C++ cruft. <laughs> okay, this was one of my favorite... Um, interview questions asked me when I was first like interviewing for, for programming jobs. I want you to switch the values of A and B. Oh no. Alright? How do you do that? You create a temporary variable C and you, you juggle it all around, right? Unless you're using Python or Go or C++. <laughs> Sit back and let me show you how this is done. Okay, so so what does this look like in Go? You say A, B equals B, A. Done, right? In Python, whatever. In Go, similarly, or excuse me, in C++, you can do, you can say tie A, B, make tuple B, A. Okay? I think. Yeah, this is great. Alright, 5, 1, or 1, 0, instead of 0, 1. 
this the five was from this CF. Right? Is really cool, huh? Now watch this. I might not get the same right. Um, so let's say I wanted to do this instead. Pi A B equals some func. Right? Because like I told you, the, 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 the whole reason I want to do this was so I can return multiple values from a single function. Let me show you how, let me show you how that's done. I think you just do a make tuple here. Okay. Let's talk about the syntax. The functional programmers in the room, like people who really know about programming languages, will tell you that this is really <coughs> cool. You, you, it's, you do auto on the return type, and you actually specify the return type here. There's a reason that's really cool, and I don't really know what that reason is. That's how you can do it now. You can specify the return type after the function name. So, so why? What, what's the point of the auto if you're specifying the return type? So once again, in keeping keeping with traditional C++ style, this auto actually means something different than this auto. <laughs> <laughs> if I read the literature correctly, it just it just signifies that you've oh God, you have. I, I think that goes back to the linker. How how, how it's going to be. Uh, Object code oh, really? uh, in auto is how it, it it populates the old object file. Oh, so this is actually the traditional use of auto. This is the, yeah. So like I said, those of you who, who would miss the creptiness of C plus plus, there's still a bit in there. Um, but this is huge because for the longest time, that's one of the things I love about Python is you just return a bunch of stuff from a function or from Go likewise. Oh, I guess I should make it run before you leave, right? Oh, I guess I should see that. Okay. So, five was from the get example, one and zero, they did swap, and then I populated A and B with four and two from that function. How are we doing today? have a lot less time than I thought. This is good, because I was concerned about running out of content and <laughs> having to watch the Weather Foundation videos or something. <coughs> so, okay. So, lambdas. Lambdas are another one of these things. Who, who here knows what lambdas are from like other programming languages? Because um, I'm not really super familiar with all of the really awesome use cases of lambdas, but the only exposure to lambdas that I've ever used are in Python, and people complain about Python's lambdas because they can only be, um, they have to fit on the lines and have to be like an expression or a statement, whichever one. It has to be an expression. It has to be an expression, right? So there's, there's a significant limitation with that. JavaScript, I believe, has true, true lambdas, and a lot of, like, Go has true um, anonymous functions. The only use I've ever, the only real world use I've ever had for them, so once again, this is more a testament to how limited of a programmer I am than, you know, their actual utility, is with Python, um, I guess I can show you an example here. Well, I wanted to sort a dictionary in Python, a key value mapping in Python, according to the value. So you can actually specify a, a function that, that will be used, kind of like a comparator function in some of the C++ stuff. And so what you do is, how are we just trying to look it up? This might not work, but. So Steven is 32-ish, one. <laughs> Michael is 30. Derek. 
you missed a uh, quote on the microphone. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Close, close. <laughs> Okay, so in no particular order, right? Dictionaries in Python do not guarantee any sort of order. But I wanted to sort, I wanted to print them out in age sorted order. So the way you do that is e.items will return a tuple, right? Here is a tuple, Python tuple now, of name. Key value, right? This is, this is a Python dictionary. Key value, key value, key value, key value. Notice these are in the same order, but they're obviously not in the order that I specified. They end up being sorted in, like, I think, hash order or something like that. Anyway, they don't guarantee any sort of order. And I want to sort them in according to the age. So what you do is you can say sorted. You can run into these guys who are sorted, right? And you'll see Brian, Derek, Michael, Stephen. Default behavior apparently is grab the first thing and then sort it by the, the, for the index zero of the, of the iterable. That's not what I want, right? I want it sorted by something. So if you, you specify this optional key parameter, I want you to sort this way. So you say lambda x, and you say x1. says is, I want you to take, so here's this little kind of anonymous function, sort by the negative of the second index. You see that? So this is the only real world example that I've come across where an anonymous function was useful. So question, mm -hmm. um, with that lambda, do you have the scope of other things that are going on or do you only have the scope of x? I believe you only have the scope of x. That's a good question. I don't know. I don't know. But I do know the answer to that in C++. So shall we return back to C++ land? Yes. Okay. So I just wanted to kind of give you an example of, of the only, of my, of why my understanding of lambda's awesomeness is so limited. It's the only time, time I've ever used lambda. <coughs> so this is the syntax right here for lambdas on line 52. You start with the, with the, with the brackets or brackets. You specify what the lambda is going to be able to capture. So this answers your question, AJ. Right? And here, here is the here is the rules for that. If, you, if it's empty, it captures nothing. <coughs> if you say bracket, you explicitly put something like this. This means x is by value. This is traditional syntax, right? By reference. Why is by reference? Here, grab everything by reference that you can. Here, grab anything you can by value. Here, grab everything by reference except x is going to be by value. Here is grab everything by value, so on and so forth. So, yes, you can specify that in C++. Huh. Then comes the argument list. Then you do arrow optional return type, and the body of the lamp. So let me let me let me run you through an example of what that looks like in real C++ code. Here's my initialized list of integers, or excuse me, vector of integers. And I want to know what the total is of these, of the, of these integers. I want to traverse this collection and accumulate a total. Right? So I use for each from algorithm. And I say, here's the beginning of ints, here's the end of ints. Here's where the lambda begins. It's kind of cool because, oh no, it's still, Vim still kind of, I think this is a Vim complaint about syntax. But here it is, right? Here I want to pass total in by reference. Int x is going to be each of the, each of the items here sequentially. And what I do is I say, well, I want total plus equals x. So there's an anonymous C++ function. Now on this line here, I just print out the total. And then here is an example of, of it's not necessarily an anonymous function, but, but I'm capturing this function here, right? Let's say auto my lambda doubling chunk equals capture everything by reference. I guess I didn't want that because I don't actually use it in here. So 
and this is a typo, this should be nothing, but it'll still run. Integer x, right? It returns an int, and this is what it does. And this doesn't have to be a single line. This can be whatever you want it to do. And I just multiply it by two. So I've made this anonymous doubling function. Not anonymous. I've made this, this function here, and, and I can use it. My lambda doubling function total. Right? So it's going to take total, whatever was counted up here, and bring down. Questions? Okay. I hope someday to keep trying to get better and better at the trade. And one of these days I'm going to learn a functional programming language and learn what is so cool about the lambdas. But C has them now. <laughs> <laughs> Feel the power. Feel the power. Okay. So regular expression and threading. I'm coming, I'm coming to the close now of the talk. Primarily because I, I wanted to prepare some examples of regular expressions, some examples of threading. I actually have some examples of threading, um, no examples of regular expressions. But the truth is, I'm going to point you guys at what I was reading in a second, so you may want to be there. But this is where I really want to really want to emphasize: like, it wasn't really all baked into into any of the compilers that I used. Right? I had to build bleeding edge GCC. I tried. And was, I was successful, actually. At, okay, so I wanted to use regular expressions. I tried, nothing worked. Actually, it was worse than that. It compiled, and then threw an exception when it started doing regular expression stuff. Which is really confusing, because then I was like, well, if it's just throwing an exception, maybe I just don't have a modern enough GCC. So I tried building GCC latest, like 4.7. I still did the same thing. And then I read, oh, well, GCC actually doesn't support that. So read your support matrices. Um, so I started building Clang. And then I finally got to build with Clang, but it was like there was a compile option that I was missing, and I added that one, or a compile flag, and I added that one, and it finally compiled. So you can get it to compile, the regular expression examples. Uh, okay, I will, I will say one thing that's cool about the C++ support of regular expressions. Um, who's, who's not familiar with the, with the regular expression literal syntax in Python, where you say R, and then you do a quote? And then you don't have to escape your backslashes. Do you guys all know about that? C++ has that. Yeah, cool, huh? So you can do capital R, and then there's a whole syntax for doing that. And you don't have to be escaping stuff as much. So that's really cool. Um, the other thing they have is, you know how in, in C++ you can, you can say um, something like this. You can say um, float f equals 12.0. You know, you can optionally say that, optionally say that. They now allow for user defined of these. Yeah. Once again, beyond my, my abilities. But you can do that. You can do that. That was kind of a cool one that I came across. So I mean let's let's look at the let's look at the um, <coughs> Cc. <laughs> this is straight from. Let me actually go ahead and point you at the website. Solari, solarianprogrammer.com. So this guy here, solarianprogrammer.com. If you click on C++11, he has a list of, one, of a blog posts that are extraordinarily useful. A couple of regular expression tutorials, a lambda tutorial, and some multi-process or multi-threading tutorials. And then, these are the ones that I found the most useful. Compiling LLVM Clang, LLVM Clang and Lit C++ on Linux, so you can get the, the Clang goodness on Linux, kind of spelled out how you do that on Ubuntu. And I thought we have them here as well on how to get it compiling GCC as well. Oh, here, building GCC 4.7 on Ubuntu. So if you want to try if, there, if there's stuff in the support matrix that you need GCC 4.7 for, he spells out how to build that. It took a long time on my really crappy laptop that I needed to plot the certain web pages. But it was cool. I could, I could compile some of the things that I could because of the default compiler that shipped the system. 
And then, so this, this, this example is directly from his site. So who, who here is not familiar with what it takes to do threaded programming in C++? Okay. Okay. In Python, you just import threading and you use the built-in threading, right? Perl, kind of the same thing. Um, Go has current stuff built into it. There is no way with the standard, like C++ standard, to do concurrent programming. You reach onto the shelf and grab pthread. So you reach onto the shelf and grab MPI or OpenMP or any of these third-party libraries. There's nothing built in. Now it's built in. You pound include thread, and you can do stuff like this. Here's a standard thread, T1. You pass it in a function. Call it thread. And you say t1.join is going to run it, and it's going to join it, and then you return it. So this is a this is a threaded program. That dumps four. <laughs> okay. So my confusion on this now. This is a, this is a new. This was this morning as I was preparing this talk. Don't worry. Some of this talk was not prepared this morning. It was prepared early. Um, I was like, oh, I want to show this threading stuff, and I finally I figured out what it takes to get it to work. If you look at the at the make file, for some reason you have to still specify this dash p thread. Now that I think about it, I can't recall what the minus p is on the compiler. Does anybody know what minus p does? For some reason I thought it was p thread, but it's not. It's minus p the thread. I don't know. For some reason, There's make, p threads in the Linux kernel, right? Though. Is that a confusion? Um, I know that it uses. Usually, the dash L P thread if you need it. The dash L P thread, right? In the library, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I'm saying. I'm, I'm not sure. For some reason, dash P thread. No, it's it's a special option. It's a special option. It's a special option yeah. for C plus plus Okay. So you if you want to do threaded programming using the new standardized threading stuff, and on on this guy's site, on the Solarian programmer site, he does demonstrate, he's got a GitHub account there, GitHub repository with clone. He shows this is what it looks like in standard, like pthread, and this is what it looks like in the new thread stuff. And it's a bit prettier. It is a little it is a little bit, it is a little bit nicer now. So, for example, thread two. So this one's a bit more interesting. We're actually going to launch a bunch of like a thread pool, right? Like Python multiprocessing pool. We have this little thread pool. We're going to launch n of them. Num threads. I'm guessing it's constantly ten of them. We're going to launch ten of these threads, right? Call from thread. Launch. And then we're going to join them. So I'll be honest, I've not done very much like pthread coding, actually at all. All my threading coding's been in other languages. But this is pretty legible, I think. And it runs. So if you do